certainly it's truth and fiction, but that's so mundane. What are your driving interests? Well, uh, my whole trip is nonfiction, obviously. Um, and, you know, you keep talking about, you know, Lemire and all these things, and I was never, cinema was not what makes me do these things. So it was all about new journalism. So for me, since I was young, you know, it started with, you know, Lester Bangs and Hunter Thompson, and then I figured out what new journalism really was with Tom Wolfe. It's all about the man in the white suit. So, you know, there's a great article online. It's one of the most inspiring things I've ever read. It's called The Birth of the New Journalism. It's, it was published in New York Magazine. And uh, Wolf took Gay Talese, Norman Mailer, Joan Didion, Terry Southern, believe it or not, a young Robert Crisco, Joe Esterhaz, who was writing for Rolling Stone, and put it all under this umbrella of new journalism. And they all have very, very different styles. But each and every one of those journalists, they were reacting against objectivity. Some of them, like Gay Talese, worked at the New York Times. I think Tom Wolf did also. And they were bored to tears with objectivity. And they decided to go for subjective truth. And through that, they believed, and Wolf articulated it first, what Werner Herzog now talks about as getting to the ecstatic truth. And that, to me, is what I've always been trying to do. So if, if you felt that, then great. Mm -hmm. How did you get interested in this particular story? Well, this was, this was great because I was a blank slate. I didn't know beans about J.T. Leroy. Um, I'd never heard of J.T. Leroy. So when the scandal broke in 2006, I don't know anything. And then um, a few years later, uh, it cooled off. And a buddy of mine, a journalist who you know probably, Paul Cullum. Oh, sure. Yeah. So Paul and I are close, and he, he knows I love, I'm always looking for a great story. He says, you, you know, you ought to check this out. So I... You know, I went online, I must have found just so much ink was generated from this thing. Huge pieces, Vanity Fair, Salon, New York Times, New York Magazine, I read all of them. And the hook for me at the time, because it was being labeled that, as you see in the film, it was being called the biggest literary hoax of all time. I was like, wow, that's interesting, I want to check that out. So I read all this stuff, and I just had this sneaking feeling that there was just so much more to the story than we were being told. I didn't know if that was true or not. So based on that feeling, I reached out to Laura. She'd been curled up in a ball for a number of years. She'd been excommunicated by the literary community and had been financially ruined. And uh, I sent her the devil and Daniel Johnston. And you know, I don't know if everyone in the, in the room has seen it or not, but if you haven't, it deals very vividly with the intersection of madness and creativity. It's basically the film. People call it a music documentary, whatever. That's what it is. So it spoke to her. And, uh, you know, she decided, she said, I'm going to share my story with you. Uh, other people had approached her previously, I came to know, and Hollywood had approached her, and she turned everybody down. But she knew that I had actually come out of punk rock, and we learned later that she did too. She had a punk rock salvation. And... Uh, and she was a Jew from Brooklyn, and I was a Jew, and that meant, that, that meant something to her. So she said, I'm going to share it with you. <laughs> from Bayonne. Um, <laughs> exactly. So um, when did you, how long did, did this whole pro process take? I mean, when did you start it, uh, talking to her and begin working on the film? Well, there was a number of years of just schlepping the idea around and raising the money. So we didn't get to really start until... The film took about two years to make, so I didn't go into official overdrive until I was financed, because I just can't. So um, she had sent stuff from her sister in Brooklyn, and there was this box, and I refused to open the box until I was financed. And when I opened that box one day, after we got financed, because it was time to catalog stuff, inside was all the Super 8 films from her mom. So the Super 8, I was like, now, once again, Daniel Johnson film had massive Super 8. So that was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. We have Super 8. What's on the Super 8? And it turned out to be her, you know, these fantastic child films I was able to make her backstory sequences with. So that was step one. And, and the tapes, were those, are those recreations or are they real? Oh, they were 100% real. Just, just like Daniel. Uh -huh. uh, it, I mean, it's, just, it's a coincidence. I couldn't have known this. Laura documented her entire life. 
just that simple. She had everything. Her mom had started the process with massive scrapbooks. We had her earliest, you know, childhood dolls. I found all of her earliest writings. Uh, she, that's her voice at the group home when she's 15, taping herself, her young girl voice. And then, of course, she taped all the phone calls. Um, so she was always documenting. And all the snapshots, like all that Bono stuff, she's running around snapping. Who do you think's taking those photos? That's her. Uh, Savannah with the, the bones, like in the house, like she's snapping. She, like, there wasn't a story point that she could tell me that I didn't have documentation on. It was unbelievable. It was thousands of photos. The greatest revelation was finding her early young girl notebooks because they had pages and pages of, she had telephone hotline helpline addiction since she was young and she would call the young boys and you never saw so many helplines, she would call anybody and in the margins were all these little boy girl doodles and that's, that became the animations in the film. So it was incredible to get yeah, I mean, it was a rabbit hole. I don't know how else to say it. How did you come about deciding to tell the story the way you told it? Oh, okay. Well, it just, it was a puzzle. And it was so complicated to crack it and understand it. And then once I finally was able to understand it, I came up with this, the, the three-act structure that I felt was the most satisfying. Uh, if you found it sympathetic, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, I obviously loved her her books. I read her books after she saw Devil. And I loved Southern Gothic literature. Flannery O'Connor was a big deal in college for me. And uh, I thought that's what Sarah was like. And, uh, you know, I thought it was important to honor that art, that writing. And, you know, I approached the story very non-judgmentally. It's not a moral tale. I'm not interested in moralizing. She's very honest about all of her deceit in the film. And I just... You know, I'm an empathetic listener. I interviewed you a long time ago. <laughs> and you are empathetic. <laughs> and so, um, what was it like working with her, and, and how, how has this film impacted her? her? Well, working with her, you know, the core of it was, A, her handing over the archive, me going in a bunker for, my God, it had to be six months of research to somehow get through it all and prepare for this long interview that we did. And then we did eight days together. And it was all on her. And all I did was, we did her whole life, soup to nuts, we, you know, linearly. And over eight days, she shared it all. She did not hold back. And that was fascinating. I think uh, it was definitely, because she told me it was a breakthrough for her to be able to do that. I think it was cathartic for her, because uh, no one had given her that opportunity. Or if they had, she chose not to. So. She came to share. So that was quite an experience. What kind of response has this film gotten? Uh, well, I mean, it's been out in England for a few weeks now, and we're seeing a lot of press, and you know, it's getting largely pretty fantastic reviews. People are enjoying the, the filmmaking and her story. And, and, and for some people, it puts them off that they're, it's not a standard documentary with a lot of other talking heads saying things and some people say that as well and that's fair they could say whatever they want so it's been um i mean i don't know you guys just saw it so however you felt you felt but and the construct of the film is these are fiction well i mean it's a fact the books are fiction uh she lived in fiction, it's not, you know, it's a pseudonym. There have been uh, women who've written as, as men over the years. This just happens to be the first one that went so far off the page into, into life. It's a unique pseudonym. We've never seen anything like it before. Uh, and, you know, when she was on the phone as a young girl, she told me these stories. She lived in fiction because she had so much self-loathing and self-hatred for herself and her body that she would, she said, you know, to quote her, Sometimes it was difficult whether she would eat or make a call. So she would spend all night long on the, on the helplines. And she said she never knew where the story would go or how long the story would last. So fiction was her oxygen. And she ultimately did channel it into these books of fiction. 
All right, it was kind of like this. Like, remember when you were a young boy and you, you hear like that there's Beatles uh, clues, I buried Paul clues, or Paul is dead, right? So I remember hearing that, and I remember vividly the playout groove of Strawberry Fields Forever, and you do it for the first time, and you hear, I buried Paul, and you're like, holy shit. You think it's the greatest. You start looking for all the other clues, right? Well, I'm reading her books, and, you know, it was, she was hiding in plain sight. The title, of course, The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things is clue number one. <laughs> and then inside the books, as you see in the film, she's burying these clues that she's going to get found out or she's hidden, she wants to tell. And I made the animations out of those. So it was like finding I Buried Paul clue. She knew it was going to come out eventually. But what, what I guess ultimately now is not that surprising is that you know, the themes of those two books essentially are sexual abuse and physical abuse and gender fluidity. Uh, obviously she wasn't a lot lizard truck stop West Virginia prostitute and all the above, that was fiction. She got that from her phone sex clients. Uh, but she was, it turned out her own, she was channeling her own themes of physical sexual abuse and, and, and gender fluidity. So the themes of her fiction were her, her own true themes, which you know, at the time of the scandal breaking, I don't, well, it was impossible for people to give her credit for that because no one knew any of this. Yeah, yeah, and the film does seem to really say, in a way, that there's an honesty to both her life and these, her novels that transcends the fictional author she created in the beginning. Well, once again, in this film, as, it, there's never been more deceit told but I, she told it all honestly. I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> uh, she tells you she's speedy, and she's speaking British for you, and she's in front of Gus Van Zandt. She's telling you, she's showing her hand. It's a magician show, showing, her, you know, showing their hand. So I found that endlessly riveting, um, and I still do. Well, what was the eight days like where you interviewed her? I mean, was it, it must have been exhausting. Yeah, absolutely. It was the longest I've done long interviews, but not eight days before with someone. And uh, no, it was. I mean, it was hard for me too, because I had such a mess. I mean, you, you talked about the notebook I brought to see you at the Austin Chronicle. This was thicker. So yeah, this was a thick notebook. So there was a lot of material to cover, and we covered it, and that was the goal. And you know, film is an expensive taxi meter. It just is. So there's that pressure as well. I'm just wondering from a narrative standpoint, throughout the movie there's this obvious shadow that she casts that's cast on her from this notion of childhood abuse that, that she works through with James Leroy. Why narratively did you just decide to kind of substantiate that through her telling it at the very end? Like, why is that the final note? Can, can people in the back hear the question or... Do I need to repeat it? Okay. The question really was about the whole film, that one of the shadows is childhood abuse. It's hinted at throughout the film, and yet it's not till the very end that she tells her own, you know, specific story of childhood abuse, and why did you make that decision? Well, the good news is that you saw that it was shadowed from the beginning, so that's good. <laughs> and then, it, very simply, it's the inciting incident, and it's a literary holdback. And it's a film called Author. So, mm -hmm. and, I, and it was the only place it made any sense. I, the second I put it at the end, I knew that was the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, to satisfy a few people who made a comment like that, I tried it in a few other places, and the film just fell apart. But uh, it always worked. The second I saw it there, I knew. So it, it, the inciting incident should be the end. I just what you're yeah, that was the thinking. Yeah. But yes, the foreshadowing of it all is important, of course. You, early on, you introduce her telling the story, which is kind of a gutsy move because it frames it. Did you, was that an early decision, or did you revisit where she would enter into the film? You talk about when she comes in on camera, or when she comes in on camera. That was uh, I must have ripped that first act apart three times. That was very difficult to figure that balance out because she was a mystery voice hiding in a bathroom, and we wanted some suspense. There's a lot of uh, cold openings to tease you in, and then it just finally got it right. It, it, it was the toughest thing to figure out where she enters. But she's, you know, 
she's the whole film, and she had to enter sooner than later. We couldn't hold her back any longer. <laughs> Legally, did you have to get clearances from the people who've been taped? Or? Uh, uh, we, you know, like just with Devil, and any film that gets released, we had our, our team of lawyers worked arduously to vet the entire film, or we wouldn't have a film right now. And in addition, they reached out to let people know and, and answer any questions that they might have had. So everything got vetted. So when, um, did, had she done any other writing besides Deadwood? I mean, anything for Milch or anybody else? Or did she pretty much stop writing when the hoax opened? Like, well, she, it's not in the film because we couldn't go longer, but uh, she wrote a massive amount of articles for papers and magazines all over the world. Uh, any, anything from food to travel to celebrity pieces. There was tons of J.T. Leroy out there, so she was actually very prolific. Um, and then there was the screenplays for, uh, for Elephant, which became a non-screenplay movie. And there might have been a few others, actually, in there. Um, so she was very, very busy writing all the time outside of the three uh, JT books. And, there's, and she gets sued by one of the film companies for signing the JT Leroy. Yeah. Was she sued by anybody else? No. Uh, she got, that was a contract for uh, Sarah. Someone was trying to make Sarah. And... Uh, it's contract law, you know. That's what that lawsuit was. But it was an expensive lawsuit. The question is, has he learned anything more about her or other pieces of the puzzle that would in any way impact or change the film? It, to be quite honest, no. I mean, I had, I had everything. I had access to everything. There's a couple great deleted scenes that I... The film was running longer at one point, and I, I made the decision to cut it. The magic length is an hour 50. That's what Devil was. And we had to bring this in at an hour fifty. So there's scenes that break my heart that can't be in the film, but the film's a better film at this length. The question is about Jeff's understanding of authorship and truth and art. And, you know, and given that the way the film is presented, it seems like she's being very honest in a lot of ways. And has this affected your sense of uh, you know authorship and truth? And I mean, I didn't think about it while making it, so it was very simply, it was like, all right, I just want to tell this story really well. And through the process of trying to tell it, and we got to the end, I realized through the subjective, immersive journey, it raised the question, you know, where does fiction come from? And I was not thinking about that as like a thesis statement three and a half, four years ago when I started the process, I promise you. But that was the outcome for me. And I found that, you know, just fascinating to ponder fiction on a, a whole other level. But I wasn't, I, I wasn't aware of it when I started. It was just much more elementary of A, B, C, D and laying out a, a story well. It's interesting because with Daniel uh, Johnston, um, you know, where Daniel, it, it, it's, it's certainly honest. But da if anything, Daniel very much created his own, very consciously created his own myth, except that Daniel also, I mean, any one given time, there's 60 Daniels in the room, and three of them may be doing something, and two of them, may be, and then who knows what the rest, I mean, so it's, a lot of things are going on, but, but, you know, one of the things that strikes me is that, you know, in, in a way, Daniel is, is not as honest as she is in terms of some of what he's doing in terms of perpetuating the myth of Daniel. Does that make any sense? What do you think? It's very interesting. <laughs> well, listen, I mean, let's say Lord Albert is front and center with the fact of all of this deceit, so that's just its own element. I think what you're talking about with Daniel, because I, I agree with you, actually, I mean, some of the most fascinating material is Daniel the myth maker, but he did, like Laura, also create, let's call it a very real fictional universe of actual characters that lived and breathed and had themes, and so did Laura. Maybe, so maybe they share that in, in Daniel's fiction and Laura's. Daniel's art and music, to me, from day one in 85 when I discovered it, was so autobiographical, and that's the reward of Daniel's music and art if you really want to dig in. Like nowadays, everybody has, you know, Wikipedia knowledge. They know a little about a lot, but these are really fun rabbit holes to spend a lot of time in, and then you really get the rewards. So, and I think that's how you do Daniel. And, and Laura now, yeah. If 
you want to go visit those books, I think you'll you'll experience them in a whole new way if you have read them or if it's new fiction to you. The, the question is about how she was scared to participate in punk rock cult culture and actually, you know, in, in an early J.T. Leroy incarnation, sends her sister out as a right. character. And then she's embraced by uh, the punk rock establishment, if you will, and then rejected. And what did, you know? What do you think about that? Well, it, you know, that was strictly body issues with the punk rock thing. And the, you know, the coincidence is that that was her behavior, like to have an avatar, which of course, I'm sure you're connecting that Savannah many, many years later. I, she did this. She did everything when she was young. Again later with JT. That was just how she operated. Um, the, you know, whatever, the literary, the art, the music establishment, ultimately, not all, uh, turning their back on her at the outcome, you know, people, people were uh, outraged. Uh, it was a huge scandal. And, I, and what I think the film shows, which is true, is that, you know, it, it was a media shitstorm. So what's it like to be in the middle of a media shitstorm? And how people felt, it was a mosaic of responses, which is still to this day. So some people, you know, wanted to burn her at the stake. She was a heretic. Other people, oh my God, this is the greatest thing since sliced cheese. This is even better. I love it. <laughs> Courtney Love and publishers. And some people who were very close, like the proximity to the story, uh, you know, were very, very hurt. Uh, and, and everyone in that, with whatever their proximity was, was entitled to feel however they felt. And Laura would tell you the same thing. I mean, she, she would never take that away from anyone. She knows exactly what happened and, and how people felt. Um, in the back there. Um, yeah. Just like what you were saying, was it your uh, idea when you first started on the project that you thought, well, I'm going to get quotes from all these people with all these diverse reactions? Did you start along that? Did you start along the path of focusing primarily on her, or did you have the idea that maybe I'm going to bring in more? Uh, yeah, both were organic processes. With Daniel, believe it or not, you know, Daniel's, the, what I love about the Daniel film is he's not interviewed in his own film. That was a great idea. But it didn't start out that way. Because <laughs> Daniel, I did, I probably did eight days of interviews with Daniel. I threw him all in the garbage. Daniel, when I met him in 2000, could not tell his own story. So he didn't. And then we had other people had to tell, and he's, you know, more interesting as an enigma. Um, with Laura, I was open at the process to whatever would happen, but it organically became that she was a fantastic storyteller, and that's a rare thing, and she should be telling her story, and yes, other people, you saw some of them are in the film. They're there when necessary, but it was a better story and a more immersive journey going down her road, I felt. Two questions over here. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, was it strategic not to interview the son and the husband? The decision not to interview the son and the husband. It was not strategic. The the husband and I had a breakfast and a dinner over the years, and he was going to do it, and then he ultimately decided just not to. He just couldn't bring himself to be interviewed. So it was his choice. And the son was under 18, and he was kind of out of bounds. He just became 18 recently. And he's seen the film, and, he, and I got an email, and he liked it a lot. What, what the, the relationship between her and her husband, the dad, is that that's, that's basically in the film. They split over okay. what went down between them. And, but they share a child. And they're both great parents. The question is about the, the fact that this became like a, a, a group effort. And so how did that dynamic work itself out? And, had, and, you know, and how did they come into to, to the, their roles in constructing this narrative? Well, you know, obviously I never interviewed Jeff because he chose not to, and Savannah also chose not to until, I don't know, two months before Sundance, she called me, and then she wanted to be in the film. I said, well, it's too late. We made the film. And uh, we decided, myself and the producers, let's go down to, she was, uh, she's studying for an MFA in Virginia, and let's see if we can get one line for her as like a little thing at the very end, and that's what we ended up doing, and thank God it worked out because it was a big trip. Um, but the mechanics, I'm hoping, are baked into with Laura telling you that she's on the phone and then downloading to Savannah, and Savannah's in public. I mean, Laura was the director, so she was spinning all those plates of information and then Savannah going out in public, but then 
Savannah being the actor in this role, having to freestyle around it all. So it was very complicated, and uh, hopefully that comes through. Because um, I, I think when she's on the road with Ozzy in Italy, you know, she's worried, and all of a sudden, you know, her Barbie dolls are come to life, and they're going off without her, and now it's like, she, it's very Cyrano-like. Thanks very much. It's a remarkable. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming. <laughs>